The U.S. talks about so-called competition, but they don't actually want competition. The, what, the U.S., the West in general, but specifically the U.S., wanted China to always remain in a subordinated position. And basically, when the U.S. normalized relations with China in the 1970s and eventually allowed China to join the WTO, the World Trade Organization, in 2001, basically the, the U.S. government's idea is that China would always be subordinate and that China would only have the low value added industries that the U.S. didn't want. And instead, the U.S. would focus on the most high tech technologies. Well, now China is at the very high end of, of technological production. And I think what we're seeing now is a new transition. And we can see this reflected in statements from, for instance, the 19th National Congress of the CPC, in which the, the, Chinese, the, the Communist Party of China announced that it's the primary contradiction in Chinese society was no longer the need to develop the productive forces and overcome what they referred to as backwardness. The CPC announced that the new primary contradiction in Chinese society is uneven development inside the country and the pursuit of common prosperity. So decreasing inequality and also developing the less developed regions like in the West, for instance. She emphasized the importance of common prosperity, the importance of fighting inequality, and he called for reducing excessive income is the term he used. So China is, tr is, is in a transition moment. It's a very exciting moment, but the Western media is portraying this as collapse, which is the exact opposite. It's not collapse. It's moving to a new phase. And we can see this with the, the industries in which China has become the world's leader, especially in solar panels and wind turbines and in electric vehicles. So our next guest is, his name is Benjamin Norton. He's the editor-in-chief of Geopolitical Economy Report, and he has been on this show many times. Ben, welcome back to this show. Thanks for having me. It's always a real pleasure. So, you know, my first question for you, because you moved to China a few months ago. I mean, there's a major move, major change. So after living for in China for several months now, uh, how do you feel about China? How is it different from the China that you heard or knew before? Well, fortunately, when I was doing a lot of research and reading about China, I was mostly ignoring the Western media propaganda. If you had only read that and then you came to China, you probably would be surprised. I wasn't surprised at the very high living standards and the high quality of life here. But I mean, it's really nice to experience that. Um, of course, my experiences have been the opposite of what you read about in the Western media, which is full of so much disinformation and propaganda. But um, I mean, what, what's really incredible is the infrastructure. I mean, just in, in every single way, especially the public transportation, the train system, the metro, um, the this, this safety and security is absolutely amazing. I mean, you know, I'm from the United States. I lived in Latin America for several years. Those, these are regions of the world that are notorious for having a lot of insecurity and violence, and China is the exact opposite of that. Um, the, the political system is, is absolutely fascinating, and I've been learning a lot. It's been nice to, to have more experience. Uh, my experience has also been nice because people are just so kind. They're so nice and generous, despite the fact that I am studying Mandarin pretty intensively, but I'm still not very good at speaking Chinese. So people are very patient. And I do have to say something that was that did pleasantly surprise me is actually the food is is amazing. Um, so my, my only real complaint is the horrible cold weather. <laughs> this winter has been absolutely horrible. And I, I remember... Uh, I, I met some Russians here, and they were complaining that it was colder <laughs> in Beijing than in Moscow. <laughs> I'm sorry, that, but like this winter indeed is very cold in Beijing. I think it, uh, last week it was minus 15 degrees yeah. Celsius. But, you know, two weeks ago I was in Jilin province in northeast China. Uh, minus 15 is the highest temperature there that week. It was minus 22 degrees Celsius Oof. in Chile, <laughs> so <laughs> I was freezing as well. So, uh, well, but you will got to see the big snow, the 
ice world with a huge display of ice sculptures. You know, that just shocked me. Well, Chinese engineers are not only good at building skyscrapers, uh, railways, they're also good at making ice sculptures, make the scenes you only saw in movies real in life. I mean, that's another amazing part if you're traveling and living in China. Yeah, I, I've seen the photos and videos, and, and I have friends who said that they were going to go visit. And I said, sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to go with you. It's just too cold. I, Beijing is cold enough for me. I don't need to go to negative 30. Like, I don't know if I could survive that. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, earlier in this show, I told my uh, viewers, because I did a poll on my Twitter and uh, also my YouTube community to ask people, uh, what aspect about China they care about most or concern about most? I think the choice the, that got most votes is the China's rise and its impact on the global order. That's the question most people curious about. And if you read international media, Western media, of course you will feel China is the is a threat. Uh, China is the next power gonna uh, dominate the world. Um, uh, that's the media projects. And I do get a feeling when I was in the United States, many people, um, if they know something about China, they will feel China is, uh, is a competitor, is a threat. They worry about going to China, even though they haven't been to China. They s they're so scared about going to China and even get arrested somehow, which is like, why are you getting arrested? But they're already so scared even before going to China. But if you thoroughly read China's foreign policies. Uh, for example, if you read uh, the work report delivered by Chinese President Xi Jinping at the 20th Party Congress, uh, he said his China is committed to narrow the gap between Global South and Global North. And no matter what stage, what phase China has reached in its development, uh, it will never seek to be a hegemony. It will never seek to dominate the world. Uh, and it committed to, to, to make peace for the world. I mean, how do you see, how do you make the China's role on the global stage? Will, will it be positive or negative? Well, I mean, this is just hypocritical projection of what the West has done. Since the, the late 15th century, the Western powers have colonized much of the world and engaged in genocide and war and ethnic cleansing, and they're projecting their own crimes into other countries as if China were, were going to do the same, which is ridiculous. I mean, China does not invade foreign countries. China does not have an interventionist foreign policy, whereas, of course, the U.S. is constantly invading Iraq, Afghanistan, wars on Syria, Libya, Yemen, the list goes on illegal unilateral sanctions that the U.S. has imposed on one quarter of the world population, representing nearly one third of world GDP. So these are hypocritical acts of projection. Now, China's rise is unique in many ways. First of all, China is really the only country that was formally colonized or partially colonized in the century of humiliation. It's the only formally colonized country that has gone to now being an upper middle income and eventually an upper income country. I mean, it has lifted itself out of poverty and has done so peacefully, not through war and slavery and imperialism and exploitation like the Western powers did, like Japan did as well. I mean, Japan was a colonial power. So what China has done is amazing, lifting 800 million people out of poverty. According to the World Bank, three quarters of world poverty reduction, of extreme poverty reduction, since the 1980s has been thanks to China. And if you also look at other metrics, like for instance, uh, re reduction in pollution, if it were not for China, global pollution would be increasing, that is air pollution. But thanks to China, world air pollution is declining because solely because China has made such massive strides just in the past decade in, in big cities, especially like Beijing, where it's quite physically visible to see the changes. But, you know, I think another important point to keep in mind is that a lot of the Western propaganda about China, of course, a lot of these, these so-called China experts, they don't actually want to understand China. They're projecting their own view, uh, their own views onto China. But what's actually happening is that China economically is going through a moment of transition. The Western media keeps claiming ridiculously that the economy is going to collapse and all this nonsense. No, what I think what we're seeing is 
a historic transition that you can say is in some ways kind of like the 1978 reform and opening up era that began under Deng Xiaoping. Now, if you look at, at Chinese modern history, after the century of humiliation and, and feudalism and, and colonialism in 1949, the Communist Party of China leads a successful revolution. They, they capture Beijing. They liberate the country from feudalism. They re redistribute land to peasants. They provide equal rights for women, and, and they ban you know, patriarchal pr practices like foot binding and, and accomplish all these very important things and begin the process of industrialization. So from 1949 until 1978, you have this very important period of establishing sovereignty for the first time, of providing gender equality, land reform, and the beginning of industrialization. And by 1978, China moved into a new era in which the country recognized that it had the basic industries established and it had redistributed land and had provided you know the basic necessities to massively increase its industrial production and through the reform and opening up era china did welcome in some foreign direct investment but under specific conditions and specifically using policies like joint partnerships with local firms to create Chinese firms. So they're not simply just providing cheap labor for foreign firms. China also made sure that foreign investors engaged in technology transfer. They massively educated and developed human capital so you can have scientists and engineers. And, and since then, China has moved up the value chain of global production, beginning by producing very low value added products, you know, toys and basic electronics and things like that. And in the past 40 years, China has moved up to the very top in terms of the value added process in manufacturing production. So China now represents 31% of global manufacturing production value added. And in every single industry, including now, it is competing with Western companies in semiconductors, in quantum computing, in AI. And those three areas, of course, are the areas where the US is waging a tech war on China and imposing sanctions and trying to prevent Chinese firms from actually competing. You know, the US talks about so called competition, but they don't actually want competition. The what the US, the West in general, but it's specifically the US, wanted China to always remain in a subordinated position. And basically, when the US normalized relations with China in the 1970s, and eventually allowed China to join the WTO, the World Trade Organization in 2001, basically the, the US government's idea is that China would always be subordinate and that China would only have the low value added industries that the US didn't want. And instead, the US would focus on the most high tech technologies. Well, now China is at the very high end of of technological production. And I think what we're seeing now is a new transition. And we can see this reflected in statements from, for instance, the 19th National Congress of the CPC, in which the, the Chinese, the, the Communist Party of China announced that it's the primary contradiction in Chinese society was no longer the need to develop the productive forces and overcome what they refer to as backwardness. They've China has already gotten to the, the highest level and the CPC announced that the new primary contradiction in Chinese society is uneven development inside the country and, and the pursuit of common prosperity. So decreasing inequality and also developing the less developed regions like in the West, for instance. And at the same time, President Xi gave a historic speech in 2021 for the meeting, the meeting of the Committee of Financial and Economic Affairs, in which she emphasized the importance of common prosperity, the importance of fighting inequality, and he called for reducing excessive income, is the term he used. So raising the living standards, now that 800 million people in China have been lifted out of extreme poverty, increasing the living standards further, so decreasing the wealth and income of the very rich and increasing the wealth and income of the poor. And, and also, she has highly emphasized the importance of not just having growth for growth's sake, but rather having high quality growth. So this is the new economic model, which is one based on 
producing the most important technologies in the world and especially green technology. So China is, tr is, is in a transition moment. It's a very exciting moment, but the Western media is portraying this as collapse, which is the exact opposite. It's not collapse. It's moving to a new phase. And we can see this with the, the industries in which China has become the world's leader, especially in solar panels and wind turbines and in electric vehicles. China represents more than 80% of world investment in renewable energy technology. This year, China installed more solar panels than the U.S. has ever installed in its history and continues to move forward, helping the world in this green transition. So, so I mean, China is no longer just, you know, unfortunately, when I was young, there were a lot of stereotypes about, you know, made in China and these, you know, toys and cheap products. No, China is at the cutting edge, and that's why we're seeing such propaganda by the Western powers and this trade war and tech war, because the reality is that as much as the U.S. talks about competition, they actually don't want China to compete with them. They want to, themselves to be the economic hegemon. Mm. You know, earlier in this show, I had another guest, Andy Mock, to analyze China's economy and I shared this story with him as well. I can share it with you again, because he, uh, he mentioned uh, a Chinese girl that he, he talked to the same age as him that uh, when she was young, she had to worry about not having enough food to eat. Now she has to worry about uh, having too much food to eat, how to lose weight. And I totally resonated with that story because I told him when I was a kid, I was malnourished because my parents, my grandparents didn't have enough uh, protein to feed me. So I had a weak bones. That's why I didn't grow taller. Uh, that's that uh, how, what my family was. Didn't have enough nutrition food to make me uh, be a strong baby and grow taller. But now I have too much nutrition. I have too much selection of good food. I worry about how can I lose weight? How can I stop eating? So, I mean, this is the dramatic change within the lifetime, my lifetime. Uh, I'm in my 30s. So, I mean, this is the story. One, my story is just one small story of the 1.4 billion Chinese people and what we have experienced. We didn't have flushing toilets. Many households didn't have running water. But now, even the most remote household, herdsman's house, in deep in the mountain in Tibet, they will have electricity connect, connected in their house. They will have a well, uh, water resources in their, in their own yard. And um, so um, even in deep mountains, just one herdsman's house in this whole field, um, but the government is not leaving them behind. Make sure you have the basic necessities. And in some villages in Guangxi and Yunnan that I visited, uh, which were lifted out of poverty by 2022, uh, the villages have, which didn't have roads at all, uh, then already had roads leading to each household to make sure the farmers can just bring the fruits they grow from their yard to the front door and have companies buying their products, get, uh, sh uh, bring those products out, out, out of their provinces to make a fortune. So, I mean, this is the change happened to me and happened to many villagers that I talked to, that I interviewed. So, like you mentioned, during this rise, China didn't colonize any other country. And many of my viewers and comments also said uh, China didn't drop any bomb by any other nation, didn't colonize any nations. They just develop, uh, focusing on developing themselves. And so I think um, China's development shows there's, it's possible that we can have a peaceful development. It's possible that we can develop without exploiting others and that's probably the i hope many people will, s will, will learn from that i mean how uh, what's your thought on china's peaceful development well it's absolutely right again the the u.s is constantly invading foreign countries intervening in foreign countries in fact i did a report in which i looked at data that was published by the u.s government's congressional research service and it found it listed this is a u.s government document it listed 469 foreign interventions by the U.S. that involved the U.S. military in the history of the country. And what's important about this document is if you look at the, the listings since 1991, since the overthrow of the Soviet Union and the end of the first Cold War, 
you can see that there were 251 U.S. interventions involving the military. That is to say that the number of foreign U.S. interventions has increased in the past few decades, including after the Cold War, which is supposedly an era of peace. You know, there's this propaganda term, Pax Americana, is what, you know, Western pundits will use, which is ridiculous. It has not been peaceful for Iraq, for Afghanistan, for Libya, for Syria. It hasn't been peaceful for the people living under sanctions in Iran and Venezuela and Cuba, the people of Cuba who've been suffering under an illegal criminal blockade for 60 years. China does not do any of that. China has a non-interventionist foreign policy. And that, I, you know, what's funny is some people will, will even say that they wish China did more and actually intervene in some good ways. But China is very, very inconsistent with not intervening, which is very important because it's the exact opposite of the Western colonial powers. And, and another quick point on this, which is so important, is that the reason that China was able to do this is because the Chinese government is not controlled by large corporate interests and billionaire oligarchs like in the US specifically, but in many of the Western countries. I mean, with increasingly where they've implemented more and more neoliberal economic policies, the Communist Party of China is firmly in control and acts on behalf of the interest of the people of China, not on the in, in the interests of a small handful of billionaires. Yes, there are some billionaires in China, but as we've seen in the disciplining by the state of these billionaires like Jack Ma, they're very much not in charge. And if they engage in very speculative behavior that is bad for the, the country and bad for the economy, they will face consequences. They will face cons uh, confiscations. They will face, uh, you know, taxations in the form of being forced to donate, you know, and, and give to charity, which is essentially taxation, right? So it's very clear that in the U.S., there are a lot of billionaires and they control the government. The government acts on behalf of the billionaires, whereas in China, there are some billionaires, although fewer over time, and they do not in any way control the government. The government is controlled by the Communist Party, which is why it is able to develop in this way. And it's why it doesn't need to invade foreign countries to take their natural resources, to exploit cheap labor. I mean, it's a fun, it's a completely different political and economic system. Whereas in the US, let's not forget, the Supreme Court under Citizens United said that corporations are people and they have civil rights. And that's to say that and they actually have more rights than actual people who are of, you know, of blood and, and flesh, right? And corporations have no limitation on the amount of money that they can give to politicians. That is to say, in the U.S., it's the so-called best democracy that you can buy. It, over 80 percent of people running for House and the Senate, and that is the Congress, who have more campaign contributions win the election. That, that's not an actual democracy. It's, it's a plutocracy. And that's why U.S. foreign policy is so belligerent, is so hawkish, because these wars are not on behalf of the people of the U.S. and their interests, of course. It's on behalf of the interests of large corporations and the military industrial complex in order to impose this imperialist system in which countries in the global south are not able to industrialize and develop in the same way that China has, in which they're trapped in the cycle of dependency. There's, they can only export their cheap raw materials and low value added products. They're not allowed to create the kinds of industries that China has done through a state-led development model because anytime they try to implement another model, the U.S. invades them or imposes sanctions on them, as we've seen in Cuba for more than 60 years. Mm -hmm. And so before I have you go, uh, do you have some more things about China that you want to tell our viewers? Yeah, I think it's it's very important. I mean, if you have the opportunity to visit, because, you know, you can read a lot about a country, but until you you visit it and see it with your own eyes and and speak with people and make some friends, you really don't understand it as profoundly. It's it's a very important experience to have in life, at least once. And you know the the Chinese government recently changed a policy that made it very easy for people from numerous European countries and also Malaysia to visit China without a visa for 15 days. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important step. And the Chinese government is trying to encourage people to people ties, which I think is an important move as well, and encouraging students from the United States to to travel to China to study. And I think that's very important as well, because unfortunately, we know that the, the government in the U.S. is so out of touch with the people and does not represent the people of the U.S. who tend to be against wars. And they want things like 
you know, universal health care and education, but they don't get them because their government is actually not democratic. It's controlled by oligarchs. So it's important to come and visit. And also when you see all of this ridiculous propaganda about the Chinese economy and collapse and all this, I just want to stress that it's nonsense. China is in a moment of transition. As always, when a transition happens, there can be a, a period where, you know, you're pulling off the Band-Aid and it can be a bit painful. But, I mean, there, the, the issues in China that, that exist are greatly exaggerated. The issues of debt, for instance, which it's never mentioned that, yes, there is a lot of debt in China, as there's also a lot of debt in the U.S. and many other countries. But, but we're, we, all, we constantly hear comparisons of apples to oranges, as if these countries were the same. In the case of China... The financial system is is state owned. It's public. That is to say that much of this debt is owned by state owned banks, and they can decide whether or not they will bail out some of these companies like Evergrande and such. So we we hear about you know Evergrande, which is like this. It's it's trotted out as this example of how the Chinese economy is collapsing, but it actually it was a decision by the Chinese government not to bail it out. So. In reality, you can't just think about the Chinese economy in the way you think about the U.S. economy, where it's the the banking system is completely private, and it's act and it acts in a very speculative and irresponsible way. That's basically basically a big casino. It's based on gambling. So, you don't compare apples to oranges, and definitely look for alternative sources of information. And of course, one of the best ways is you can check out the work that I do at geopoliticaleconomy.com, and I have my channel Geopolitical Economy Report. But another great way is you should check out the work that Jing Jing is doing. She also <laughs> does amazing work and I always really uh, get a lot of the get a lot out of the interviews that you do so thanks a lot for having me it's a real pleasure thank you so much Ben thank you so much hope you have a good night and see you next time Ben thanks <laughs>